please welcome Mr. Moran, Chief Communications Officer for the Pacific Council. Hello, good morning or good afternoon to everybody joining us today, depending um, from where you're joining us. My name is Marissa Moran Gantman. I am the Chief Communications Officer at the Pacific Council on International Policy. Thank you for joining us for another installment of the Edgerton series on responding to a rising China. This series is made possible by generous support from Brad and Louise Edgerton and the Edgerton Foundation. So thank you so much to them. Today, we're hearing from Ambassador Chaz Freeman, a career diplomat and chair of Projects International Inc. on the topic of relations among China, Taiwan, and the US. A few of the many highlights from Ambassador Freeman's career include his role as Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs in the Clinton administration, during which he received the highest public service award for reestablishing defense and military relations with China. He served as US Ambassador to Saudi Arabia during operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm. And during the 1980s, Ambassador Freeman worked as Deputy Chief of Mission and Charge d'Affaires in the American embassies at both Bangkok and Beijing. And before that, he was Director for Chinese Affairs at the US Department of State. He is currently a visiting scholar at Brown University's Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. Ambassador Freeman, very good to have you with us. Before we get started in conversation here, I want to launch a, a brief poll for our audience to see what, what baseline attitudes are toward today's topic, namely the relationship between China and Taiwan. So everyone should see that poll launched on your screen here, and you'll have about 10 seconds to select an answer. And <coughs> while everyone is making their choice, um, I can just remind you that our format is going to be a moderated fireside chat between myself and Ambassador Freeman for about 30 minutes, and then we'll open the floor to Q&A from the audience. So you'll have questions. If you have questions, you may submit them to the Q&A box that you have at the bottom of your screen throughout the conversation. And then towards the end of the call, we will switch over to, to answer your questions. So we're gonna go ahead and close the poll and share the results with you so that we can have an idea Okay, so it's a pretty close split. The question was, do you believe a conflict between China and Taiwan is likely within the next 12 months? And 41% said yes, and 59% said no. Um, so actually, we, we can certainly get started on, the, on our conversation here, really just thinking about that question. I'm curious your answer, uh, Chaz, what you would respond to that. Well, in fact, we are, uh, they are in a conflict. Um, the Chinese Civil War has never ended. Uh, the United States interrupted it and suspended it with the Seventh Fleet on June 27, 1950, after the Korean conflict broke out, um, with a view to stopping both Chiang Kai-shek from uh, resuming attacks on the mainland and uh, stopping Mao Zedong from conquering Taiwan. Uh, so the Civil War was suspended. Um, it never ended. Uh, and uh, in part, uh, what is going on at the moment uh, is the breaking of the framework that the United States with uh, Nixon, Kissinger, and Jimmy Carter over the course of the 70s worked out to maintain peace between the two warring parts of the, of the Chinese polity. Um, at this point, um, it looks to me as though those who think a conflict is likely meaning I assume armed conflict beyond the current peaceful situation, uh, probably are right. Thank you for setting us up for that to really understand what's happening today and sharing that history. Um, you know, this month, October 2020 was a busy month for cross-strait relations. On October 15th, China released a letter to Taiwan's intelligence organs in which it cautioned Taiwan spies against, quote, against supporting President uh, Tsai Ing-wen's resistance to unification with China, end quote. The letter included the words, quote, don't say we didn't warn you, end quote, which is a message previously issued by China before engaging in military operations. In addition to the letter, China dispatched military aircraft toward Taiwan on 25 of the 31 days in October, the highest frequency of sortie against the island all year. So, if you're the United States, what do you make of these actions by China? Are they unique or do they represent a sort of business as usual between Taiwan and the People's Republic? Well, they're not business as usual. Um, up until the US normalized relations with Beijing, 
meaning uh, broke diplomatic relations with Taipei, uh, recognized Beijing as the legal government of all of China, uh, withdrew our military and in, military installations from Taiwan and uh, closed the embassy, um, switching to unofficial relations. Up until that moment, the two sides were firing at each other um, between Xiamen um, and uh, Jinmen, or sometimes Amoy and Kimoy. Uh, Kimoy is an island that blockades uh, Amoy uh, city in Fujian province. They were firing at each other in a very Chinese way every other day. One side would fire on one day and the next on the, on the other day. And the purpose was to maintain um, consciousness of the fact that this was a civil war uh, and that they were at war and they still are at war. Although they have worked out a lot of mechanisms within the one China context for cooperation across the strait. Um, there are millions of Taiwanese who visit the mainland um, many, many live there. Um, a huge number of Taiwan businesses are on the mainland and uh, mainland students have been in Taiwan universities and so forth. So there's a great deal of interaction of a peaceful nature, but the fundamentals uh, haven't uh, really changed. What is different now uh, is the stance of the United States. Um, we have as I said, we worked out a very complicated, uh, subtle framework to maintain the peace in the Taiwan Strait. We have been backing away from all of the commitments we made under that, uh, under that arrangement um, progressively, and maybe we can talk about some of the details. Uh, so this has put China in a strange position. Uh, in the United States, there are a great many people who imagine that China is eager to have a war over Taiwan, to take Taiwan. Until recently, that was not the case. There are a great number of Chinese now who in reaction to the American apparent repudiation of previous agreements, do think this might be a good time to finish the civil war. And oddly, whereas we think the Chinese leadership, Xi Jinping and others uh, are belligerent, want a war, um, their problem is they're trying to resist their own public's demands for a war. So um, I think the Chinese look at the United States and see us as uh, no longer concerned to maintain the peace in the strait by any means other than military confrontation. And I don't think that represents the view of most Americans. Uh, I don't think Americans want a war with China, which is a nuclear power. Um, and the subject of the war would be China's borders and China's territory where it, where it is. So we have a perfect inversion of misunderstandings. Um, and um, on top of this, and here I will conclude, we have an extraordinarily confused transition going on in our leadership um, in which it's not clear who's in charge. Uh, people are being fired right and left uh, from important positions that would have to be in place if there were conflict. Uh, the incoming administration, Mr. Biden and company, are being denied access to intelligence briefings to help them understand what might happen. And if you're sitting in Beijing and you are under pressure to do something, you're never going to find a better moment than this one, the, the two months between November 3rd and January 20. So this is a time of great danger, not only inside the United States, as many have been discussing, but also in East Asia and in US-China relations. Really important next and last week, like you're saying, what's happening in the US in our own domestic politics, and then um, looking at what happened on November 9th uh, in with the US Marines, it was reported, so just so that I can uh, make sure that our audience is up to date on this, on November 9th, it was reported that the first time since 1979, US Marines are on Taiwan training, they uh, are training Taiwanese counterparts. So this was a very strong signal of support from the United States, but you're right, as at the same time, there is turmoil, political turmoil in our own country. Um, so do you, you know, from your, from your understanding, how was that message received in Beijing? 
Well, I, I would say first that um, the Marine Corps, while not denying that report, has said it's inaccurate. Uh, exactly what that means, we are left to guess. Um, but uh, if there are Marines there, as I assume there are, however inaccurate the report may be, the Chinese will take this as a further signal of unrelenting implacable American hostility that can only be countered by the use of force. So we have inadvertent, we have tried to send a signal of deterrence, but in the current political context in China, we have sent a, a, a message of provocation that adds to the likelihood that uh, the Chinese will find a way of doing what they need to do in their view. They want a negotiated solution uh, in well, the Taiwan issue. Um, to do that, they have to convince Taiwan that it will lose something very important if it doesn't negotiate and do a deal. Nobody negotiates anything unless they think they're gonna gain something by it or they're afraid they'll lose something if they don't. So they want to convince Taiwan that time is not on Taiwan's side, that uh, they will inevitably have to come to some accommodation with the Chinese across the strait. And they want to convince the United States that things have changed um, that as every war game we have run in recent years has showed, um, if we get into a war with China over Taiwan, we lose. So this is something most Americans don't understand. The balance of military power in the Taiwan region has shifted pretty decisively in favor of the mainland. Um, and uh, so even before you get to the problem of escalation control. How do, you, how do you contain, how do you limit a war when it's on the territory of your opponent? You know, this is not Korea, that was a third country. We could have a limited war there, it was pretty awful, but we had a limited war there. We could have a proxy war in Vietnam, but to actually fight the Chinese on territory that they all consider to be theirs, to strike at targets in the mainland and expect that our own homeland will not be struck. Uh, this is pretty risky. So I think the Chinese have been thinking as creative politicians always do about some middle ground, some compromise, some action that intimidates Taiwan, but doesn't cross the red line and provoke the United States into actual combat. And I think there are a number of candidates for that. And I'm sure they're being debated in China between those who favor an all out assault on Taiwan and those uh, who want to avoid war with the United States. That makes a lot of sense. And it is it is revealing absolutely, I think, and our our role in that and what we have to risk as well. Uh, coming back to the conversation you started about the the I guess the opportunity in a sense that our um, political confusion over here creates in China. Do you anticipate China taking advantage of the presidential transition period as smooth or not smooth as that might go? The more we provoke them, the more likely, likely they are to feel obliged to react. Um, I can't um, make a decision for them or assume that I can understand exactly what they might decide under conditions of of rising tension with the United States. Uh, but, um, you know, I think we start with the, the recognition that uh, Mr. Trump and Mr. Biden both agree that we don't need any new wars. We have a lot of problems at home that we need to deal with. Mr. Trump, in my view, never really mastered the government that he was supposed to lead. He never was able to uh, end the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq or uh, get out of Syria, although he wanted to, um, because uh, his, uh, what his predecessor called the Washington playbook overcame him. Uh, he could not find a way to uh, develop policies consistent with, with his own views within his own government. Mr. Biden is much more experienced at that, um, but they both agree that we should end the Afghan and Iraq and Syrian adventures and uh, concentrate on dealing with our main problems at present, which uh, I would say are obviously the pandemic, which is 
rising in intensity and ever more lethal. Um, an economy that is sinking under the burden of uh, COVID-19 produced lockdowns and, and uh, uh, job losses and uh, the deflation of the consumer economy. And finally, I would argue overarching problem, um, a, a constitutional crisis in which uh, the president is not subject to any supervision or control by the legislative branch anymore. The Congress, both houses, um, duck issues rather than standing up to be counted. For example, they have the exclusive authority to uh, authorize wars, but they let the president do it and they don't question it. Uh, their response is support our troops, which is not much of a reasoned policy because maybe the troops are in the wrong place and know it. Um, and finally, we have a Supreme Court, which um, frankly is in a crisis of legitimacy because of the selection of judges on a partisan basis and their approval on a, on a, on a, on a partisan basis. That is not unconstitutional, but it is politically destabilizing and debilitating. So all three branches of our government and the separation of powers between them are in a state of crisis. Um, and it is in that context that uh, we're going through this transition in which um, the president uh, is refusing to acknowledge the outcome of the voting um, and doesn't seem to have a path to actually reversing the votes. Um, or overcoming them, and nobody's been able to describe how that would happen. Um, and uh, we have uh, Mr. Biden unable to take advantage of the, le of the legal uh, authorities, the help that he should get from the executive branch to begin to take charge. Uh, so uh, we, with, with no one clearly in charge, with disagreement about who is the future president. Um, this is a moment of great vulnerability, I would say. Well, let's assume that we are able to get through this moment of vulnerability and it becomes more of a, a blip on our history instead of a scar, which none of us, or even worse, which none of us hope it does escalate further. Um, and that a uh, president-elect Biden is inaugurated as planned and expected on January 20th um, and the Trump administration peacefully and gracefully at some point departs the uh, White House. Would, what do you expect, you touched a little bit on um, how you imagine a relationship between the US and China might be different under a Biden administration. How do you expect a Biden administration would approach the issue on Taiwan? And then would you elaborate on uh, what you anticipate relations with China to look like, or broadly? Well, let me first tell you what I think is most likely to happen. And then let me tell you what I think should happen, okay. which are two very different things. Uh, what is most likely to happen? Mr. Biden is a unifier. He likes to reach across the aisle and do deals with opponents. About the only thing that unites Democrats and Republicans now is antagonism to China. So if you're looking for an issue on which to build a relationship with the other side, be tough on China. I think that is the instinct of many of the people who are coming in with Mr. Biden. Uh, they are retreads, if you will, from the Clinton and Obama administrations, um, who, uh, who many of whom were very unhappy with the previous policy of cooperation with China and uh, spent a lot of time thinking about ways to counter China. Uh, I don't think there's anyone in that group who spent any time thinking about how to cooperate with China, even as we compete with the Chinese. Uh, so I, I believe that Mr. Biden will, from the Chinese perspective, be as hostile as Mr. Trump, maybe a little cleverer about it. Perhaps he will form international coalitions or try to do that to uh, enlist allies, partners, and friends in, in support of the US contest with China. Um, Mr. Trump has been wholly bilateral. He doesn't like building coalitions, and he hasn't. Uh, maybe he will 
respond to corporate interests, uh, consumer interests that argue for walking back the tariffs, which, which, which have cost the American economy a lot of jobs and cost consumers a lot of money. Uh, but, you know, Mr. Trump has left him with, with things to trade, meaning tariffs, sanctions. He can use those to get um, things from the Chinese, perhaps. Um, usually sanctions are only useful when they are relaxed. And when you put them on, they just, they just entrench antipathy. So um, I think he may be uh, clever about uh, a tough stand on China, but he's not gonna alter it in my view. Now, what should he do or the United States do? I think the first thing, because in the end, uh, whether your word is valuable or not is your major asset in international relations other than the use of force. If you can't be trusted, no one will negotiate with you. No one will, will take risks by doing deals with you. Um, and so I think the first thing is the administration needs to sit down and review all of the commitments we've made to China, to Taiwan, um, and look at whether we are honoring those or not. And if we're not honoring them, I suppose there are several approaches you could take. You could say, well, can we get away with not honoring them? Uh, that is one approach, which seems to be the dominant one at present. Uh, or, um, you know, is there merit in changing our behavior on this particular issue one way or another? So there should be a general review. Second, with China, which is after all, a global force um, and which our relations with China are going to determine a great deal of the 21st century's course, I think we all believe. With China, we need to sit down and do something we haven't done since the Nixon and Kissinger era, really. And that is a bottom-up, zero-base strategic review. By that, I mean, let's look at issues like Taiwan or the Iran nuclear program or the issues in North Korea with proliferation or, well, you name it, uh, many, many issues. Let's sit down with the Chinese and say to them, how do you see this going? What do you think will happen if, no, if neither of us does anything? Is that good for you or is it bad? Do you think it's good for us or bad for us? Uh, do we agree that this trend is something we should try to buttress and continue? If we do, are there things we can do either together or in parallel um, in an informally coordinated manner uh, to increase the likelihood that the trend will continue? If the trend is against us both, are there things we can do that will deflect it in a better direction? Um, this is the kind of discussion that opened the relationship with China. And I think it, we, need, we both sides need to think hard about having such a dialogue again, because the consensus that we had, the understandings uh, have either gone away or they are frankly being violated, mostly by the US side, but by the Chinese as well. Uh, so we need to put this relationship back on a firm basis and that's gonna take some hard and imaginative diplomacy. Seems that at the top of the list of those things uh, that need to be cooperated on, at least according to the Biden administration, will be climate change as well. That is uh, correct. And that is an obvious case where, you know, climate issues, environmental damage, degradation, um, are, is the, these issues are the number one issues in Chinese politics. This is what causes street demonstrations and protests. Um, this is what gets people into trouble with the anti-corruption forces. And um, Chinese have at least as strong, maybe even a stronger interest than Americans in addressing climate issues. They're committed to doing so. Um, this is a common interest. If we can't cooperate on that, I don't think there's any hope for cooperation on anything. But you, you need to pick issues like that. You, another one would be uh, non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. Um, and I would argue that 
now that we've destroyed the World Health Organization, um, from the point of view of the United States, we need to, as Mr. Biden has said, we need to get back into it. We need to cooperate with the Chinese to manage future epidemic situations better than we manage this one, to develop uh, vaccines, to uh, understand more effective ways of preventing the spread of disease. Um, this is something we, anyway, there are a lot of, I would say, I call them planet-wide issues, which require everybody on the planet to work uh, to address them and can't be addressed effectively if the US and China take different or uh, conflicting approaches. So it's not, that's not rocket science. The question is, um, given the overall hostility, the technology war, the trade war, the, the um, US forces that are right off the coast of China, um, peering into it and making mock attack runs at Chinese harbors to discover their defenses. Uh, given this, uh, the games of chicken in the South China Sea, uh, given these things and the Taiwan issue, um, are, is either side really able to set those differences aside to cooperate on something else? I mean, it's very hard to compartmentalize a relationship. Uh, it doesn't work in marriage. Um, you can't, you know, scream and yell at each other in a vicious manner at the breakfast table and then come back and have a pleasant lunch. And, you know, it's just not, you can't work relationships like that. Human beings have, have limits. Perhaps rationally, we should uh, be able to do that, but we're not. And um, so uh, I think we need to pay attention again, as I said, to the overall strategic context, the uh, issues that we can we can agree on, the things we can work either together on, or at least in the same direction uh, on, and, uh, and and that requires uh, some pretty imaginative and hard diplomacy. And there, as a final note, I think the Biden administration, to its distress, is going to find that the governing capacity of the United States government, the capabilities of the government, the expertise, the experience, the institutional memory of key institutions, especially the State Department and the Foreign Service have atrophied uh, under the last four years. Uh, that wasn't when this began, uh, but um, the process has gone to the point where Mr. Biden will issue an order um, and there won't be the people to carry it out in the proper fashion. Uh, so rebuilding institutions is going to be re repairing the morale of the intelligence agencies, the Department of State, uh, rebuilding confidence in the, in the civil service. This is something that the new administration has got to do or it will find itself hamstrung. Thank you, Chaz. This is all really helpful context to understand the relationship between the US, China, and Taiwan right in this moment. Um, I want to begin to the Q&A chat and we will get to your questions in just a do, uh, I do sort of back and go back a bit in time. I'm sure our of your experience were so many different administrations, frankly, and in particular, even I thought you might share a little bit about your um, your time as translator for President Nixon. Um, well, I was the principal American interpreter uh, on the Nixon trip, um, mostly, however, um, uh, because Nixon uh, was a bit paranoid, as you may have heard, um, and he preferred to use only foreign interpreters. That is a very bad practice for many reasons, not the least of which uh, is the possibility of misunderstandings. And I'll give you an example of that in a minute. Um, the, um, I was the principal interpreter, but mainly for the Secretary of State. What usually happens at summits is that the chief of government, in this case, the president, Zhou Enlai, um, the premier in China at the time, um, get together and talk about positive things that we might do. And the Secretary of State and the Foreign Minister get together and talk about all the ways we disagree. 
And it was very important during the Nixon trip to China to record our disagreements because there was enormous apprehension among allies like Japan um, or uh, partners in, in Asia generally, South Korea, um, the, the, uh, the, the war in Indochina was going on, um, South Vietnam, terribly nervous about this. So we did something really unique. We, we talked directly, honestly, candidly about all of our differences. And if you go back and look at the Shanghai communique issued uh, February 28, uh, 1972 in Shanghai, you will find that the first five, six pages are all, you know, the US doesn't agree with China about this, 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 and this. China doesn't agree with the US about that, 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 and that. Uh, all laid out very directly. And as I say, the purpose uh, was we had to do that to reassure our partners. Um, but I don't think most Americans got that. I don't think they understood the, that subtlety. Um, after all that disagreement, there comes uh, a, a section that says, notwithstanding the fact that we have different views, different socioeconomic systems, and so forth, we've agreed that it's in our interest to cooperate on certain things. And, uh, but here, you know, I give you an example, not from the presidential talks, um, um, uh, although at one point Nixon actually uh, apologized to me for, with tears in his eyes for having lied to me. Um, the, uh, uh, from the uh, talks at the Secretary of State level, we're talking about deterrence. This is a concept that Americans think we understand. And um, uh, unfortunately, in Chinese at, at that time, um, there was no neutral term for that. Uh, deterrence either meant um, an active threat to overcome you, um, uh, or it didn't mean anything. So uh, I got into a huge argument with my Chinese counterpart on the other side of the table, interpreter, over how to translate um, render the word deter. Um, I use the Taiwan term, uh, which is, means a, a force that um, Im impedes and obstructs, um, intimidates and instructs. Um, and um, uh, she used uh, uh, another word called wei nie, wei nie, but she mispronounced it actually because the second character was so uncommon. So I had the unfortunate uh, requirement to correct her Chinese pronunciation. Anyway, they, um, we never agreed about that. 30 years later, the Chinese Academy of Military Sciences came up with a very good neutral translation. Because I said to the Chinese, you wouldn't use this word to describe your policy, would you? Of course not, we're not aggressors. Um, I said, well, we're not either. Um, that is not the intent of this word. Uh, so anyway, uh, I will uh, I will tell you that Nixon's lie was a really stupid one. Um, he first of all he didn't tell me anything about what he wanted me to do until the last minute. Um, Dwight Chapin, who was his appointment secretary, called me to his suite in the guest guest, guest house complex in Beijing um, and said the president wants you to interpret his banquet toast tonight. I said, fine, no problem. Can I see the text? He said, well, I don't think there is a text. He's going to do it extemporaneously. I said, no way. Um, and uh, this is the major public appearance in the visit, and he's going to do this extemporaneously. No way. Maybe Donald Trump would, but not Richard Nixon. Um, so I said, I, there is a text, and I, I really do need to see it. This is not French or Spanish. And, um, and, um, so he went in to see the president, came back. So the president says, there is no text and he, he, he's gonna, he, he, he does, wants you to do the interpreting. And I said, well, uh, Mr. Chapin, it might interest you to know that I did the draft of the text. And someone in, in the White House, I know has put in, I don't know what, but they put in some of Chairman Mao's poetry. And if you think I'm gonna get up in front of the world and ad lib, Chairman Mao's poetry from an English translation of unknown provenance into Chinese, you're out of, and I used it, ugly word, uh, mind. Um, 
I said, I, you know, either give me the text or I won't do it. And um, so he pulled the text out of his pocket and gave it to the Chinese, who then immediately came to me and said, what is this poetry? And we researched it together and all was well. Um, and two days later, Nixon having recognized that he had just, you know, if I hadn't at age 27 or 28 stood up to him and said no, he would have had a public relations debacle, the likes of which um, it would be hard to imagine. So he apologized and he, he obviously felt bad about it and he didn't have much personal radar sense of distance from people. Um, and uh, so he was very emotional about it. Um, and, and later on, we made our peace. But that's the, that's the um, insignificant anecdote that you wanted, I think. Doesn't sound that insignificant to me. You could have changed the course of history, Ambassador, but that was really a great story. So thank you for sharing it. Um, I do have a couple of questions coming in from the audience and we'll start with one from Matt McNeil, who says, thank you, Ambassador, for your time today. What do you see as the most critical steps to deescalate the increasing tensions between China and T Taiwan? And what do you think the US's key policy goals should be? Well, I think, um... You know, basically, uh, Taipei, meaning Tsai Ing-wen, the, uh, I think, very gifted and cautious uh, president in Taiwan. Um, I don't think she's provocative at all. She was once, um, but she's been very careful. But she has taken China out, taken Taiwan out of the one China consensus. Um, this was a, a kind of a fig leaf. Uh, two sides both agreed, well, we're both part of China, we just don't agree who should run China. Um, that was, in fact, recognizing the civil war character of the dispute. And I have great sympathy for her um, in many ways. Um, Taiwan, which was a, under Chiang Kai-shek, a, a, a Leninist, uh, the Kuomintang was a Leninist party. Um, it was a dictatorship uh, when I was learning Chinese there. People were disappearing in the middle of the night and going off to labor reform in, on, a, on an island to the, to the southwest of, of Taiwan. And um, all that has changed. Taiwan is now an admirably uh, respectful country of the rule of law, a society that, um, uh, that has a high, very high standard of human rights. Um, it's certainly from the perspective of anybody who believes in the values of the European Enlightenment on which our country was formed, um, it certainly is the most admirable society that's ever existed on Chinese soil, but it is on Chinese soil. And that's a problem. Um, Taiwan's now decided it doesn't wanna be in a civil war anymore. But the problem is one side, just as one hand can't clap, one side can't declare a war over. Uh, you know, you remember George W. Bush mission accomplished, um, the defeated are not defeated until they admit defeat. Um, and those who are involved in the war don't get out of it until they agree that the war is over and that a new situation has been created. In order to do that, you have to negotiate. Um, Taiwan's been unwilling to negotiate. So I think um, poor uh, Ms. Tsai uh, has a terrible dilemma, her society uh, probably has a majority that wants some kind of self-determination. Um, but just think of the case of the United States. We wanted self-determination. We issued a declaration of independence. The British didn't stand there and salute. They sent an army. Um, and nobody gets independence from the motherland unless the motherland agrees. And usually that involves beating the motherland on the battlefield. So this is a very fraught situation. Um, I think to the extent the United States could adopt a posture that we would like to see the two sides actually talk, we would like to see them address the issues left over from history, that we would facilitate that. I don't think we should give advice. Uh, I think this is a problem between Chinese they have to solve. I think we could help do that if we, as I indicated earlier, reviewed the history, what did we agree to do and not to do? 
and maybe move ourselves back to conformity with that. Um, and um, try to adopt a posture that encourages rather than discourages dialogue across the strait. You know, every time the people in Taiwan, the people in the mainland have worked something out that increases trade or travel or, you know, air traffic or whatever, we've always applauded. We've never opposed it after the fact, but we've not been helpful either. I think we maybe ought to try to be helpful. That actually feeds very well into the next question that we had in the queue, which was from DJ, who I assume is our, our member, DJ Peterson, um, that uh, asking about that, uh, that China's interest in a negotiated settlement with Taiwan. And if you have anything else to add of what you think such an agreement would look like. Well, um, I have to begin by recognizing that contrary to what the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and Pacific, uh, Mr. Stilwell says, um, the Chinese have never agreed not to use force. I've never agreed that there can only be a peaceful settlement of this civil war situation. We have talked to them since the 1950s under Dulles, right up to today about that. And they, while they have agreed they did agree that in return for the United States undertaking the commitments we're now breaking, uh, they would make best efforts to try to resolve this whole thing by, by peaceful means. So there is that commitment, uh, but the basis for it, unfortunately, is being uh, shredded on our side at the moment. Um, so um, I think um, the, uh, uh, with, with that understanding, uh, we need to we need to look at um, at uh, no, no, I'm sorry I've lost my train of thought on the remind, settlement the what remind is me of the central part of the question what an agreement between China and Taiwan. What, oh yes now the Chinese have put forward terms for negotiation uh, under the the under their former president twice removed Jiang Zemin he put forward what he called an eight point proposal. Under that proposal, he said, as an opening offer to tai Taiwan, uh, there would be no PLA, no military from the mainland sent to Taiwan. Taiwan would retain its own armed forces and be responsible for defending its part of China, not against the mainland, but against evil foreigners, Japanese, Americans, whoever might want to occupy Taiwan. Um, that Taiwan would keep its political and economic system, could still have a democracy, elections, would keep its economic ties with foreign countries, um, that there would be no Chinese officials from the mainland sent to Taiwan. This is very different from Hong Kong. Um, there were no Chinese officials sent to Taiwan, uh, but that Taiwan officials could take part in a national government in Beijing. Uh, so in other words, you can come and participate in governing all of China, but we will leave you to govern your little part of it. Um, this was the opening offer. Um, and uh, it was made under circumstances which were very unfortunate, in which the then president in Taiwan um, was a separatist. Um, and he basically brushed it aside, but it's still on the books. So I think um, trying to find out my, I think, you know, if you wanted to have a re resolution of this by peaceful means, that's not a bad starting point. And uh, someone should try to find out whether that offer is still on the, you know, still there to be picked up. Thank you. We have quite a few uh, more questions that have come in. So we'll try to get through as many as we can. Let's see, we had one here. Um, from Greg Arnold, how do you think about re-entering the Paris Agreement, given that the U.S. must make reductions from 2015 onwards, while the Chinese get to increase, not reduce, carbon emissions through 2030? Well, you know, as you, I'm sure you're well aware, there is a great difference between all of the developing world and the developed world. I mean, we had an industrial revolution at the late 18th century, early not early 19th century and happily went on polluting everything until quite recently. So we had a two century start on the, on the Chinese and, 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 and others, uh, which is why there is that grace period for them uh, to continue 
uh, polluting until they begin to reduce it. The Chinese have now announced a, an obje- an, a goal of being carbon neutral by 2060. I think they're serious about it. Uh, there are a whole lot of new technologies which will facilitate that. For example, did you know that you can make uh, concrete out of uh, carbon dioxide rather than water uh, and lock the carbon dioxide into the concrete? Um, this is possible and the technology exists. It's being used in New Jersey at the moment, not that that has caused New Jersey to be less polluted so far, um, but um, uh, it's available uh, to the Chinese and it would produce an immediate um, uh, 14% reduction in their uh, carbon emissions. So I think you know there are answers and the Chinese are committed and the question is, uh, how do we find a way to cooperate? That has to be under the Paris Accords. Um, the Paris Accords have a, are a two-set, two-edged sword. In the long run, I should point out, we are the only country uh, in the world that is no longer in that framework. Um, I live in fear that the world will decide that those who are not following Paris Accord guidelines should be subjected to punitive tariffs. In other words, if we're not going to control our own carbon emissions and they find their way into our manufacturers or our agricultural products, then uh, we're going to export those at a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. Um, um, uh, This is not impossible to imagine. Uh, I don't think it's anything we should flirt with as a possibility. And I think, and going back to an earlier set of remarks, uh, planet-wide issues require planet-wide efforts to deal with them. You cannot exclude one-fifth of the human species, uh, a country that is geographically a little bit larger than us in territory, including Alaska and Hawaii, um, from that effort. And a country that that produces 30% of the world's manufacturers Now, you can't exclude such a country from the effort. We have things to learn from the Chinese. They are uh, very advanced in a lot of the renewable resource energy areas. And they now have one fourth of the world's scientists, technologists, engineers, and uh, mathematicians. These people are beginning to be very innovative, cutting ourselves off from the largest single group of scientists and technologists is not a smart thing if we want to continue progressing and sustain our leadership, our historic leadership role in these areas. Absolutely. Uh, We have a question here from Arnie Fishman, who's a longtime member of the Pacific Council. How does the Chinese work? This is quite a large question, I think, seems to encompass so much of what we've talked about here. How does the Chinese worldview compare with our, the US worldview? What is the foundation of each worldview? Um, China, of course, is a country, uh, a vast country um, that has uh, expanded and shrunk within more or less the current borders over the course of 4,000 years. Um, Historically, the last thousand years, 600 of the last thousand years, it was governed by foreigners, um, that is foreign conquerors. It has a history, it's always on the defensive. Um, And um, it doesn't have any sense of manifest destiny of the sort that we ginned up in the 19th century that took us to Hawaii where we overthrew the monarchy and annexed um, another society on the grounds that God gave us the right to do it. Um, The, um, you know, China's not without problems. It's got ethnic minorities. Um, It has separatist movements in places like Tibet and Xinjiang, uh, some of which, actually all of which the United States historically supported with covert action during the Cold War um, and which continue to be uh, troublesome elements in our our relationship. so, but the Chinese uh, geography does not lend itself to expansion. Uh, the Chinese, Chinese culture is built on a kind of agriculture that is almost like gardening. Um, it requires a certain physical environment, which is you can't practice in high plateaus, mountains, or deserts. 
or in the ocean, which is which are, is what 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 bound China. Um, the United States has been enormously blessed by natural resources. We have in North America we have something like 27, 28 percent of the world's water. We have uh, three times as much arable land as the Chinese. They have four times the population. No, they're always on the edge. Um, People's Liberation Army is not overseas. Uh, we have 800 bases beyond our borders. World War II made us a global power that we, we bestride the world with military force. We're currently engaged in almost 80 um, counterterrorism wars in other countries. Um, Chinese are engaged in none. Uh, it's a very different uh, set of circumstances. You know, Chinese, I think, would do anything to trade places with us in terms of geography and resources. Uh, they're not going to get the chance. Um, and uh, so they have to deal with what they have. And, and that puts them mostly in a defensive position. You know, there is no Chinese Navy probing the defenses of San Diego, as far as I know. Um, there is a U.S. Navy probing the defenses of Shanghai. Um, so uh, we're in their face, they're not in ours. I'm afraid we will eventually find uh, that they reciprocate our affection and uh, come and bang on our door um, and patrol off Puget Sound and whatever. Uh, uh, I don't think that's something we should uh, want. And maybe we should talk to them about uh, calling things off before they develop in that direction. Thank you for that comprehensive answer. Um, I see here that about three folks have asked somewhat similar questions. So I'm gonna just combine their questions into one, which is essentially given what has happened in, and the folks that answer these, that ask these questions, just so um, they all know that they're included in this, it's Brewer Stone, Pamela Yats Yatsko, and Thomas Maliul. And the question there is essentially given what's happened in Hong Kong, how can Taiwan trust the, the PRC and how can they trust any sort of negotiated settlement that comes out of that? Well, Hong, Hong Kong is a confused situation. And as always, there are two sides to this. When, when Hong Kong uh, was handed back by the British to the Chinese government um, in 1997, part of the basic law that is the, and the treaty that the basic framework for Hong Kong's continued autonomy, one country, two systems, was the slogan. Um, part of that was a requirement for the Hong Kong government to pass a national security law, which would ensure respect for the one country, part of the one country, two systems. Um, the Hong Kong government tried on several occasions to do that. Um, it was always opposed by mass protests um, a long number of opportunities were lost. It never did pass, meet its obligation to pass that law. And in the end, it, things got so much out of control with um, the police battling protesters in the streets on a daily basis. Some protesters throwing gasoline on others and setting them alight and so forth. A lot of vandalism, smashing storefronts and whatnot, there was disorder. And basically, the protesters provoked the Chinese into doing passing the law for the Hong Kong legislature. That was a tragedy, because it definitely damages uh, the rule of law in Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong's never been a democracy, by the way, never. The British never had an idea of giving Chinese any kind of democracy while they were in Hong Kong. Um, and to the extent that Hong Kong has democratic elements in its government, those have happened under Chinese rule, not under British rule. So um, as I say, I think there are two sides of the story. Um, the question is, what do we do about it? Um, I don't think it's helpful to do what the administration has done, which is to say, okay, uh, Hong Kong's autonomy is no more. We're gonna treat Hong Kong just like every other part of China, and we're gonna try to blast China back into the stone age. Uh, we're going to try to beat back its rise. And uh, so we're going to cut Hong Kong off all the privileges that it has had in trade. And I think this is basically adding to the destruction of Hong Kong, not helping it. 
the people of Hong Kong need help. Um, I don't think it, uh, it's over yet. I think there's huge damage that's been done to uh, Hong Kong's uh, freedoms, especially freedom of speech on matters about China. Um, you know, you can, in this country, you can burn the American flag. It doesn't make you very popular. You can take a knee at a football game. It doesn't make you very popular. You can't do those things in, in Hong Kong now without being arrested. Um, so that's, but then our standard of liberty is really rather unusual. Um, I would love to see that prevail in other places, uh, but I don't think helping the Chinese government immiserate Hong Kong is a good way of advancing liberty there. Hong Kong, by the way, remains in the estimation of most international bodies, the freest economy on the planet, the most market oriented. It's also part of China. And it's an illustration of the fact that uh, one country, two systems is not dead. Now, why should people in Taiwan trust uh, the mainland? The answer, they shouldn't, they shouldn't. Of course they shouldn't. Um, any more than people in the mainland should trust them. Um, internationally, you have to make agreements that are self-sustaining because they are in the interest of both parties. And if one party breaks them, both will suffer. Um, and there may even be a role if there is ever an agreement as opposed to an occupation and invasion and occupation of Taiwan by the mainland, uh, if there is a peaceful settlement, there may be a role for international guarantees of some aspects of it. But we're a long way from that. At the moment we're headed apparently inexorably towards some sort of armed conflict. Well, thank you. I th it looks like we might have one minute left. So I'm going to ask um, one question that I thought was interesting that came through here that maybe you could give a brief answer to before we wrap up here, Ambassador. And that was for those of us with some Chinese language ability, but not based in DC, uh, what is the best way to work on this very important relationship in the 21st century? Of course, that being the US and China. Um, I think the most important thing that those who are um, fluent in Chinese or able to read Chinese can do um, is look at original sources, uh, look at, um, uh, look at uh, uh, videos of people in China actually talking and stating positions and not accept the funhouse mirror view of the world that the social media provide. Um, we basically are, are in living in a miasma of fake news, and fabricated alternative facts. And um, the only cure for that is for those who have the ability to do so, uh, to interact directly with Chinese, to uh, watch Chinese, to read Chinese. Um, in other words, verify um, and refute when the verification is not there. And I imagine we have a whole new generation coming up who has, you know, understands Chinese as, as an essential language to have. And so I think that'll be really amazing moving forward to see how many new young Americans can speak Chinese given the emphasis now. So especially in a place like Los Angeles. Well, um, you know, China is now the largest English speaking country in the world. Wow. Um, so what they can do, we can do too, if we apply ourselves to it. Exactly. Well, thank you, Ambassador Chaz Freeman. This has been a wonderful conversation. It's been really enlightening and eye-opening on a number of issues happening uh, between U.S. and China, but also specifically between uh, China and Taiwan and the U.S.'s role in that, of course, given our, you know, our current presidential, presidential transition and this moment in our history and how we can be part of that. Well, thank you, Marissa, and thank you to the members of the Pacific Council for uh, putting up with me. Um, I hope uh, you have been stimulated um, and will make your own opinion about these things by looking into the situation directly. Thank you so much. And thank you to all that are on the line. Have a wonderful rest of your day.